Hey, everybody. Welcome into an all-new episode of Can We Please Talk podcast. As always, I'm Mike Leon. My co-host, Nick Savary, is away on vacation. He's out in Arizona, probably doing some, uh, you know, voter talking to voters out there in, in the battleground state. We'll, we'll find out more from him in the next episode. But joining me in his stay is Washington Post reporter Maria Luisa Pao. Maria, thank you for hopping on the podcast with me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to do this with you. Look, on the program today, the campaign trail is heating up. The Harris Waltz ticket is official. They're making stops in PA, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And right behind them is J.D. Vance's airplane. He's making similar stops. Maria and I are going to talk about the state of the race right now, that the VP pick is in for the Democrats. We're heading to the DNC on August 19th. We're going to get into some of the articles that Maria has done about TikTok influencers and how they're helping the Harris campaign. We're going to get into that in just a second. Plus, later on in the program, something that should be getting a lot more attention in the scale of global politics is what's playing out in Venezuela. Maria and I are going to deep dive on the elections results there, Maria's recent reporting on this, and we're going to get Maria's take as a Venezuelan, because that is very pivotal to this conversation. So more on that and what is happening in Venezuela. If you haven't been following that story, tune into the next segment with Maria breaking all of that down. Uh, before I say hello to Maria and we find out more about her great reporting, over at the Washington Post, an all new episode of the Educate US podcast is out there over on LeonMediaNetwork.com or listen wherever you get your pods. Nick, Stacey, and Patrice this week dive deep into the issue of maternal health with a special focus on the alarming disparities faced by Black women in the US. And joining them on the program is Marie Carl Talty. She's the president and CEO of the Partnership for Maternal and Children Health of Northern New Jersey. She helps them unravel this complex web of systemic issues contributing to the crisis, including racial bias and limited health care access for women of color. An episode you don't want to miss. Go listen to the Educate US podcast wherever you get your pods. And also an all new episode of the If You Lead Them podcast is out there. Katie welcomes in transformational leadership coach and the host of Stand Tall and Own It, Andrea Johnson, to discuss her work with ambitious female leaders, founders, community leaders, and public officials who feel stifled and have grown unsatisfied with their current level of impact. I love when Katie does these episodes with some of these folks in the leadership and coaching space. So go check out an all new episode of the If You Lead Them podcast over on LeonMediaNetwork.com or listen wherever you get your podcast. Now, speaking of listening, I'm going to listen to Maria tell us her story. Maria, I'm so appreciative that you were able to, to come on the program. We were talking off air about how you're... you're Friend of the pod, Sabrina Rodriguez, another Washington Post uh, reporter, another fellow Latina, uh, and and how she introduced us. So I'm so glad we we're able to have you on uh, to fill in for Nick. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what made you get into journalism? Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Oh my God, this is a funny story because I was a model UN kid, so my dream in life was to work like an international organization, and the reason why I pivoted to journalism was actually because of Chick Fil A. Um, which is weird, but it makes sense. Okay. So basically, um, there was a journalism minor introduction event. And one of my friends who was a wannabe journalist, he asked me if I wanted to go with him to this event on campus. And I was like, what am I going to do there? And he said, there's free Chick-fil-A. And when you heard that at Notre Dame, you had to go because we didn't have one on campus. That and berries. Um, and I went there and I spoke with the director, uh, Professor Richard Jones and his wife, Victoria St. Martin, and they convinced me to apply. And I did. And I think it only took the first class and I was absolutely hooked. And that's been my life ever since then. Uh, see, what a story. And by the way, free Chick-fil-A. Why wouldn't you go? Right. Of course. It's so delicious right there. And by the way, Chick-fil-A, uh, if you want to sponsor the program, uh, reach out to us. Can we please talk back <laughs> At gmail.com. Well, that's that's funny. And I, I'm glad that you got into the field. And I know it's we're going to get into some of your work, you know, touching on a topic that is very near and dear to your heart, obviously being of Venezuelan descent. But um, for you as a journalist right now, I want to get into some of the strengths of what you've been reporting on, which is the campaign trail as we get into our first segment here, because, you know, a lot is going to be made of and for people watching us on YouTube, you can tell Maria is considerably younger than me. We're going to get into younger voters, right? They're going to want to know you know, are they going to vote now for a younger Democratic ticket with Harris and Waltz? We're going to get into some of the things that Vice President Kamala Harris is doing on that front. But first, let's get into the campaign this week, because it's been making waves in terms of the different campaign stops from Vice President Harris. Obviously, she had the big announcement 
at the LaCour Center in at Temple University in Philadelphia, a place that I've been to many times to see my Rutgers Scarlet Knights lose to Temple. Um, and Kamala Harris and Vice President show candidate now, uh, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, came out on stage, roused the crowd. I want to play a little bit of this, and we're going to react on the other side. So take a listen. And just last night, the delegates to the Democratic National Convention finished voting. And so... I stand, I stand before you today to proudly announce I am now officially the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. And so now we got some work to do. We need to move to the general election and win that. And to all the friends, listen, we also need to level set. We are the underdogs in this race, but we have the momentum and I know exactly what we are up against. This campaign, our campaign, is not just a fight against Donald Trump. Our campaign, this campaign, is a fight for the future. It's a fight for the future. And Pennsylvania, we fight for a future with affordable housing, affordable health care, affordable child care, paid leave. We fight for a future where we build a broad-based economy, where every American has the opportunity to own a home, to start a business, and to build wealth. Fight for a future where we bring down prices that are still too high and lower the cost of living for America's families. So that they have a chance not just to get by, but to get ahead. I couldn't be prouder to be on this ticket and to help Vice President Harris become what we all know is very, very good for us to think about next president of the United States of America. From her first day as a prosecutor, as a district attorney, attorney general of the great state of California, a United States senator, and vice president of the United States. Vice President Harris has fought on the side of the American people. She took on the predators, she took on the fraudsters, she took down the transnational gangs, she stood up against powerful corporate interests, and she never hesitated to reach across the aisle if it meant improving people's lives. So we had them making that stop in Temple. You heard some of what they're going to say there. We're going to talk about it in just a second. But then also, as of this recording right now, they made stops in Wisconsin and in Michigan as well. Talk about frequent flyer miles, They're traveling all over the place. And we're going to get into the other side of the political aisles. J.D. Vance was also making stops in those same states as well. But first for you, Maria, on these campaign trail stops, now that now that the VP pick is in um, and you've done some reporting around some younger voters and things like that. But now that the VP pick is in, what do you make of the, is there is there a true excitement that's taking place right now as we see these crowds and these rallies with the Harris Waltz campaign, it feels like so much of a different excitement from what was happening before the debate on June 27th. Am I reading that incorrectly or is it, yeah, Captain Obvious? And, and this is what I'm hearing from voters, Mike. You know, it's really interesting because if you look at what the campaign was just a month ago, the vibes were of doom and gloom and people were kind of there was just like this negativism going on and of course things took a really dire turn when um there was that um assassination attempt against Donald Trump and everything just seemed to be spiraling down um and then all of a sudden you start seeing this excitement and not only excitement but joy like people are actually feeling positive again and i think that you really see that on social media too which is you know the way people are engaging with the campaign 
I wanted to ask you because we were just talking about, and I just mentioned before about JD Vance, and you, you just kind of touched on it. There was like an assassination attempt. And then, you know, obviously you had the convention. Vance is a younger Republican that got picked here. There was like a little bit of momentum there for him. And then all of a sudden it kind of fell flat as some things start to come out. And now we're seeing certain things start to come out about Governor Tim Waltz. You're watching this as an outside observer. Now you see the messaging start to shift from both of these campaigns, because before former President Trump is running against somebody a couple years older and he says that guy's not all mentally there. Now he's running against two people that are 20 years younger than him. Right. What have you kind of seen in terms of both of these campaigns? We played a little bit of it there in the montage, but now the messaging has pivoted and now it has to be more substantive. What do you make of the way the messaging is pivoting? Are, are Republicans doing it correctly or Democrats doing it correctly in terms of the way they're attacking the former president, but also focusing on the future? See, when you look at the campaign like throughout this whole time, it has always been kind of talked about in very existential terms. Like this is a fight. Um, this is the future of democracy. Um, this is a fight between good and evil. And I mean, this is not to take away from how high the stakes are, but I think that Democrats have sort of pivoted to, you know what, there's a lot of positive things. Look at all the things we bring. This is about the future, about passing the bat the baton on to, an, uh, to another generation that has not been represented before. Um, I think the thing with the Republican campaign is that, as you said, they had made their whole strategy based on them going against Biden, and they got a complete shift um, away from that. And I don't know if they still figured out their messaging. I mean, they're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall with different things, like calling um, Vice President Harris a DEI candidate. Um, they Donald Trump had that moment with the National Association of Black Journalists where he was like, she's not Black, she was Indian. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't think anything has stuck that well. Now they're trying to paint Waltz as kind of like a far left candidate. But when you look at his record, that's not really the case. So it seems like they're still trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because uh, just before I was recording this, I, I did a TV hit about uh, Governor Waltz and conservative leaning district that he won as a congressman. Right. He was endorsed by the NRA once upon a time. You know, he's a Midwestern guy. There was a viral video exchange of him and his daughter. And he's like, we're going to eat meat for dinner. And she's like, I'm vegetarian. He's like, all right, well, then you'll have turkey. Like those kind of things are very emblematic of a Midwestern dad. So I'm curious for you. I wanted to ask you this because I got asked this. So let me ask an actual reporter who's covering this. Um, you know, there's there's something to be said about the youth movement of this, right? Because Vance is, you know, just a couple of years younger than me at 39. And then you have uh, obviously the youth vote out here. You're trying to get more of younger voters to turn out this election cycle do you think it's wise of Republicans right now to just send J.D. Vance everywhere? Because I think the former president, and again, this is what I've heard from Republican voters here in Miami, in the, in the state of Florida, is that Donald Trump continues to play the greatest hits. And he's losing the steam, as we saw at the RNC speech that went way too long, because he just couldn't stop himself from going back to playing the greatest hits. Be that as it may of whatever you make of Donald Trump, the human being, do you think it's wise right now for Republicans to say, hey, how about we do this? How about we just send Vance everywhere because he's a younger person, because he can talk about the future of the party, because he can talk about where the strengths and weaknesses lie, why he used to be a Democrat and now is a Republican. Do you think that's a smarter strategy? I mean, it might be smart, but I mean, I don't think it's only about age at this point, right? Because Kamala Harris, like she is 60, but she has this connection with younger voters. And it, it, it's something you really can't bottle up. I mean, you see it in the fan cams that they're making of her. Like it's these kind of like iconic phrases that she said that might seem cringy, or at least that's what Republicans are trying to paint her as. It's like cringy, unprofessional, but they really resonate with younger people who are all about, you know, I want authenticity. I want someone who feels like a person and not a politician. So I think at the end of the day, it's not only about whether you're young or not, it's also about what you're bringing and what messaging you're giving. And if you're stuck on this 
um, loop of the country is terrible and just kind of like repeating the same phrases that, you know, might energize the very, very Republican base, like those people who are not who are going to vote for Trump no matter what. I don't know if that might work with someone who's on the fence. I totally agree with that. I did want to ask you, let's pivot on to what you just said about these younger voters and the way they're gravitating around Kamala Harris, because it was a recent NPR Marist Ipsos poll that shows that she's taken a small lead on Donald Trump, 51 percent to 48 percent of those 1900 plus respondents in that survey. And um, amongst that group, there's a bunch of different you know, numbers within there with independent voters and stuff like that. But you wrote an article that I thought was interesting. And I was I was texting you about this last night about the online army supercharging Kamala Harris's campaign. We, we've talked about TikTok on this show. We've had Representative Jasmine Crockett, who's very popular in the social media space and being reposted by all of these things. Talk about her social media influence on this program. And here is TikTok, what, what it becomes in a few months after the legislation, who knows. But right now, 150, 160 million user base, and Kamala Harris is kind of using it to her ad- advantage. Can you kind of break down a little bit of what the Harris campaign is doing on social media to kind of reach out to these voters? So this this was kind of like a really interesting moment in politics because in a way it was sort of like foreshadowing what would happen because it was right after the debate that people started posting kind of like these fan camps of Kamala Harris. And this was really organic. It wasn't that the campaign paid some people for this content or put them out themselves. It was people doing these on their own volition um, and, you know, going viral and just spreading like this excitement about her. And that's, like I said, that's not something that you can pay for. And what makes it more powerful is that it came from people's own initiative. Um, I think they've been smart of kind of like taking advantage of that moment. They had the Kamala HQ with the brat typology and colors and you know they've they've done um a couple of posts that kind of show like these moments of her um but again like posting a tiktok video is not necessarily going to translate to people voting but i think it does show a snapshot of the cultural reality and how people are engaging with the world around them and with her Okay, now you're going to have to explain Brat to me again. I I don't understand this. I've heard now Caitlin Collins, Jake Tapper, all these people explain it to me. I, I, I know what it means, kind of. Explain it to me, please, just as a side note. Okay, so being Brat is a vibe. <laughs> and I don't know if that makes things easier. Um, It's not, you know, like a spoiled child, like the definition kind of is. It's more so and. Charlie XCX, who's the singer behind this album and this song, um, she explained it as, you know, it's someone who is an it girl, but and but she's not afraid of being a little messy and of making mistakes. Like she owns it. She owns her vulnerability. And that's in a way that's kind of like w- how people perceive Kamala Harris. Like, yes, she might ask if people fell off a coconut tree, but she owns it and she's herself. See? Folks, that's going to be the viral clip here of Mike Leon being explained what Brad is. All right, (laughs) Maria, I did want to ask you because uh, one other thing that you did in a recent article, speaking of like the way people perceive somebody, you you, you and I were laughing about this off air. You wrote an article about J.D. Vance uh, and a vice presidential candidate with facial hair that he would be the first in decades. And now I'm looking back in the annals of you know, vice presidential picks. And I'm like, oh, you're right. They didn't have facial as I have somebody who just shaved this morning. What, can you tell us a little bit more about this article? Like what what was you trying to convey in this article about Vance's facial hair, maybe making him look more older and distinguished to Republicans? Take our audience a little bit inside of like this piece. I think this really all started because, you know, people have noted kind of like that transformation of J.D. Vance. And at the Washington Post, we had a whole story about it. Um, And it was kind of like even his friends being like, can we talk about this beard? Like, I don't know where this came from. Like, this is the whole transformation. Um, So I think his beard has always been a topic or of talking like a a topic uh, that's been going around ever since, you know, he started campaigning and now as a vice president nominee. Uh, But I feel like I wanted to wrap in these conversations, but it was also just like, a historical fun fact, like when you look at vice presidents 
in presidential candidates, you don't see beards after like throughout much of the 20th and 21st century, uh, which is just kind of interesting. Like, why did this happen? Like, why did we suddenly start stop having beards? Um, but and, and maybe it says something about the moment that the country is in and how perceptions are changing. You know, um, I remember everyone like during the pandemic was having beards and everyone was like, oh, the pandemic beard and stuff like that. So it's becoming like a little bit more um, mainstream in a way. Quick break from the pod, as always, to tell you about our friends over at Fresh Roasted Coffee, delicious tasting coffee that fuels me and Nick every episode. And now it's the summer months. It's hot out, iced coffee, cold brew, tea, iced tea specifically. Got to have all these drinks in these summer months. Nick, you a cold brew guy over there? Yeah, absolutely. The second that the weather gets hot, my coffee gets cold. Damn, that's a nice line, actually. Yeah, um, but right. yeah, I I'm I just recently tried the cold brew. I was super excited about. It. I definitely drink a lot of iced coffees and cold brews from different places. Um, I order everything from Fresh Rose of Coffee, so the fact that I can now get my cold brew as well from there, I'm totally in. I knew you would be. And for the people out there that are listening, as always, thanks for supporting Fresh Roasted Coffee because the blends, the flavors, the roast. You can go to their website by clicking the link in our show notes right now. Put in some cold brew into the shopping cart when you get to checkout. Enter in the promo code, can we please get 20, all one word. Can we please get 20 to zero? You're going to get 20% off that first purchase. Yeah, I would encourage people to go check out those articles from Maria over at Washington Post. Dot com. And by the way, the, the article I just referenced before at NPR.org about that recent NPR PBS Maris poll that's showing Vice President Harris right now having a 51 to 48 percent lead. And, and it breaks down a couple of different groups in terms of women, black voters, independents and where they've moved on there. It talks about who do you think would be better to handle X you know, crisis as president, immigration, economy, the war in the Middle East, preserving democracy, uh, women's reproductive rights. So go check out that poll. All right, uh, Maria, I, you know, the reason I initially had reached out to you as well was because of what is unfolding in Venezuela with the recent elections and Nicolas Maduro remaining in power. You're going to explain all of this at a, at a high 30,000 foot overview, and then we're going to get kind of into the weeds here. I did want to ask you some things as well, talking to some Venezuelans that live here in Miami uh, and some of the protests that have happened here, not only in Miami and Orlando, and obviously we know that Florida is a big gateway to Latin America and, and South America. So I want to get into all of it. But first, I want to ask you, if you can, kind of explain for our audience that maybe is not familiar, they don't follow geopolitics, they don't understand what is happening in Venezuela right now. Like, what is the latest of what happened with the election process and now the, uh, the other party claiming that the election has been stolen, showing results, proving that they have won this election? Can you kind of break it all down for us? Okay, so on July 28th, um, Venezuelans went to the polls, and this was what was seen as their best chance to win against Maduro after so many years of an authoritarian government. Um, and people went out in mass. And what quick counts, a exit polls, and even studies show is that Edmundo Gonzalez, the opposition candidate, one. He kind of trounced Maduro, actually. It was 67% to Maduro's 30%. What has happened since then is that Maduro, Maduro's a National Electoral Council declared him the winner of the election. And I mean, right after that, the country exploded into protest of people demanding transparency because at the heart of all of this, is that the government has not released any precinct level data as Venezuelan law stipulates. So what's going on right now is kind of like the opposition showing that they have the proof, showing, showing that they have the, the tally sheets with these numbers, the government ref still refusing to um, release any data and just initiating a crackdown that 
I had not seen in so many years. Like the level of fear that is swirling around Venezuela is unprecedented. I mean, 23 people have already been killed in these protests. There's almost 2,000 people that have been um, imprisoned or arbitrarily detained. So that's where we are right now. And um, the international community is kind of initiating these efforts to see if they can reach some negotiation um, with Maduro. You know, you can kind of hear it in Maria's voice there if you don't. Uh, yeah, like I was mentioning before, you are Venezuelan, so I can tell that this is personal to you. And, you know, a couple of years ago when Nick and I did an episode of what's happening in, in Cuba with the protests that happened there against the President Diaz, you know, that's personal to me as somebody who's, whose dad left Cuba in 1960. So I want to make some parallels to American politics. But first, I want to ask you, just you as a human being, as a person who's Venezuelan, as somebody for me who worked here in Miami at HBO Latin America and in 2013, you know, when Chavez passed away, you know, and we were moving our offices from Caracas to, you know, Bogota and Colombia, you know, I, I saw many people that look like you, Maria, to be honest, very emotional about this. And I saw Maduro kind of promise that he would be different. We're going to get into how he has not been different. He has been more of the same with Chavez. But I remember the emotions of my friends there working at HBO Latin America and my best friend who's who's Venezuelan, who was born in Venezuela. So like for you, just on a personal level, like how are you feeling with all this? How is your family feeling with all this? And do you have any family in Venezuela right now that how are they doing with this? I do have family back home. And I think I mean, this is a reality for most, if not all of the country, you know, when you have an exodus of 8 million people, that's a quarter of the population, families have people all over the world. And and that that's why this campaign felt not only like a political thing or a fight about policies, it felt like the last chance people had to have their families reunited. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of Venezuelan immigrants here in, in, in the U.S. who you know, they had to m most move through eight countries, mostly by foot. Like they didn't come here easily um, and they risked their lives to come here. And them telling me like, if Edmundo and Maria Corina win, I'm going back. You know, as a journalist, anytime there is a threat against democracy or these things happen, that's part of the job. Um, that's shining a light is like the most important thing that journalism can do. But as a Venezuelan, like this just it's it's heartbreaking because you're here and you're looking at what's happening in your country and you feel kind of like this helplessness of not being able to do anything and just watching stuff happen. I, I like I said, I can I can hear it in your voice and stuff like that. And, you know, I made fun of Van Jones for crying on TV. So we're going to try our hardest not to cry <laughs> on this podcast. No. But uh, I did want to play something for you, though, because you were talking about the world stage in the international community. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said something recently about what is happening in Venezuela. And we know the State Department and some other agencies of the U.S. have all said that they believe that the election was won by the opposition party uh, as a, and Maduro did lose. But I want to play what the Secretary of State said, and we're going to react on the other side. So take a listen to this. I want to speak quickly to the elections that just took place in Venezuela. We applaud the Venezuelan people for their participation in the July 28th presidential election. We commend their courage and commitment to democracy in the face of repression and in the face of adversity. We've seen the announcement just a short while ago by the Venezuelan Electoral Commission. We have serious concerns that the result announced does not reflect the will or the votes of the Venezuelan people. It's critical that every vote be counted fairly and transparently, that election officials immediately share information with the opposition and independent observers without delay, and that the electoral authorities publish the detailed tabulation of votes. The international community is watching this very closely and will respond accordingly. And will respond accordingly. So I want to ask you on that front, because, you know, again, one of the highest officials here in the U.S. And I don't know if the Biden administration has actually at least President Biden himself commented on what's happening in Venezuela. You can correct me if that's happened. But a statement like that, a strong U.S. statement saying that, you know, we, we don't the international stage is watching 
And we don't believe the results that Maduro's party is saying in terms of what happened here. Does it move the needle? Like what what can actually be done here besides the U.S.'s involvement, as we've seen in other governments and coups? But like in a realistic sense, does it move the needle in the international community? What does it do? I think that the involvement of the international community in all of this might pressure Maduro. But at the end of the day, this is something that's if he leaves power, it is something that is going to come in the hands of the Venezuelan people. Um, there's so many scenarios of where things could be headed, right? Like at this point, the country's sort of taking the lead with having an open channel of communication um, with Maduro are Brazil, Mexico, um, Chile too, which, and Colombia, I can't forget Colombia, which are more leftist governments. But like, I, I think it's gotten to a point where it's like, we can't defend you if you're not willing to provide these voting tallies. And I think it's important to, to explain why the voting tallies are kind of like at the center of all of this, right? Um, because Venezuela has a pretty high tech electoral system. You vote by a machine, right? And um, there's different voting centers spread across the country and each voting center has a determined amount of machines. It can be one, it can be two, three. Um, and you vote, you click on the screen, and after you vote, there's like this little tiny paper ballot that they give you with your vote, and you put it inside a box. Once the voting center is closed, there's the machine tabulates the whole thing, um, and it gives you kind of like this huge receipt. That I don't know if you've seen them in pictures. It's kind of like these long sheets of papers. We call them actas, which have the vote count for every single candidate. And those results are compared um, with the hand, with a little ballot that you put into a box to confirm that the numbers match. And then what we call the tigos, the poll watchers, the witnesses for each party, look at the results and then they sign the pieces of paper. Um, what's happened in other elections is that Maduro has been accused of different levels of fraud. I mean, there's been incidents where you know, they go um, to low income communities and they offer them bags of food or they put them inside of a bus and remind them that they have housing because of the government. And so they're strongly encouraged to go vote. Um, or maybe there's been accusations that they might have like changed numbers a little bit here and a little bit there, but there's never been actual proof of that. There's no real way to prove the fraud. And the opposition, can, uh, the opposition, like throughout this last month, they established a really complex and sophisticated operation where they realized we need to have proof. So they trained volunteers and poll watchers that were credited by the government to be there. Um, and, you know, when it came to the election night, those people stayed until 1, 2, 3 a.m. fighting to get that voting tally. And then they had like these different points throughout the city where those tallies were scanned and uploaded to this web page that anyone can check out. And it shows you not only like the tally that was scanned, but also the numbers for like the states and each voting center. And that is how they came up with the number um, that in Mundo a won with 67% of the vote. Um, the, we did a whole story and an investigation into this and you know, we had a reporter who was in Caracas and she went to one of these boat, a, like these secret stations. And she saw the tallies that were there and compared them with those online and saw that they matched. We talked to poll watchers who were there in the night and, you know, saw the results. I mean, the only reason why we can't completely verify that they're true is that the government has not released any sort of data. Um, they just gave out the results that um, the Electoral Council president literally wrote in a tiny piece of a, a napkin and read from. So we can't compare what the government has with what the opposition has because there's just no transparency. I mean, yeah, I don't I don't even know how to follow up on something like that. That is so horrific, but could come to these shores. So maybe I can transition this way because. And I'm probably going to make a couple of people that listen to this podcast upset, but 
the biggest thing that I've noticed, and again, I'm here in Miami, a lot of Venezuelans down here, you know, Colombians, South Americans, obviously I've mentioned this is the gateway, but also this is the gateway for people that have fled countries in peril, specifically Cuba and Venezuela to be specific because of the communities that are based down here. And so what I'm noticing now, Maria, is that there's this parallel of, and I can draw a through line through it. It's these Trump supporters that are posting about what is happening in Venezuela, not cognizant or having any self-awareness to what just took place in Venezuela is something that the former candidate who's now at the top of the Republican ticket tried to do in 2021. Forget about whether or not January 6th was a peaceful protest that turned into, you know, something that was violent. It doesn't matter about that. It matters about what you just said, that there was a dispute of something that they felt was stolen, but it was not stolen. So there, there's the different people and influencers making these parallels to the Trump part of this and Maduro part of this. And am I wrong in the assessment of, and again, Maduro is completely different and we, you can get a little bit more into his regime over these last 11 years. And, and, and the people that have, you just mentioned 23 or 24 folks have died in these protests so far. Um, but, but do you see the parallels there? Am I wrong for saying that, Hey, this is very similar and akin. So these Trump supporters right now that are saying Maduro is the problem. It's like, you are not realizing or lacking self-awareness because your guy just tried to do that before. It, it, do you see any parallels or synergies with respect to what is happening right now in Venezuela and what happened in 2021 with the former president? So, you know, for it, it's been kind of interesting to see how Venezuela is discussed by non-Venezuelans or by people abroad. Um, because from both sides, from the left and from the right, they try to paint this as kind of like a fight between progressive or conservative and the left and the right. And in Venezuela, that that's just not the case. Like, this is not about left or right. Um, it's become a situation where it's about, like, liberty versus dictatorship, right? Um, so the context is a little different. And I there are some similarities, but I will say this. Um I think you have to look back at what happened in Venezuela. We were the richest country in Latin America for a while. It, we had these institutions. We had, you know, so much. We were the country that received immigrants at some point. And, you know, all these companies had their headquarters in Venezuela because the country was great. What happened? We also had a two-party system, COPE and Acción Democrática, that roughly similar to Republican and the Dem Democratic Party. But some people felt left behind. Some people felt that, you know, inequality was rising and the politicians in these parties were not taking care of them. And that's how Chavez takes advantage of the situation and gets into power because he specifically caters to these people and tells them these elites are not, they don't care about you. I will take care about you. Um, and then after that, he destroyed the Venezuelan political system I, and, and just the country's institutions in general. I mean, the first thing he did was pack the courts with supporters. He was able to change the constitution. He gave himself power, basically, like all the power is now entrenched in the executive. Um, there's no checks and balances. He went after the press and said that they were all liars. It, he basically created the situation where it was us versus them, right? It was like these elites that don't care about you. They're the enemy. Um, they, they don't care about you. I do. Um, and that's how he was able to get so many love, so much support. He was very lucky because the oil prices shut up during his government. Um, and then he after he died, in, it, the oil prices went down. And so Maduro was stuck with this economic situation that had built, been building up for decades. The thing with Chavez is that, yes, there were some human rights violations, but he like he didn't have to be as authoritarian in that sense, like use repression as much as Maduro has had to over the past years. I mean, we're talking about thousands of people and thousands of political prisoners. And we're talking about a government now that has been accused of crimes against humanity. 
Yeah, it's a good summation there for, for people that, and I encourage people to kind of find out more about this situation overall. But I did want to ask you to put a bow on it. Like, where do we go from here? Because a lot of the times, you know, with, with these episodes, you know, obviously the information is going to change, uh, you know, when people listen to this, maybe in the future. So right now you gave a summation of what happened from the election process. We played Anthony Blinken's, but now, now where do we go from here? Like, is this just it? Is it just over? It, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, things on social media saying, hey, don't let us die here. Like we are protesting in the streets every day because we want this to change, but it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight for this. Like, wh- where do we go from here, Maria? I th- honestly, I feel like we can speculate every day and things might change. I mean, I remember in 2019 that everyone was like, this is it. We got it. And then we went back to Maduro and it was like as if nothing happened. Uh, but I think that, I, I mean, I just feel like it's very difficult to go back to the situation that you were in. Um, I mean, when you look at the places where in Mundo Gonzalez won, these were Chavista strongholds. We're talking about a place like 23 de Enero, um, which is a low income community in Venezuela where there's they have a ton of like missions and government housing, and you have Chavez's eyes plastered everywhere in buildings, and you have Maduro's face. and. Edmundo Gonzalez won there, according to the tally sheets they've compiled. So I think like they've lost their base. And that's why the only way to sort of keep things or try to keep things in control has been to repress and go into these communities and pull people out of their houses because they were poll watchers or because they went to a protest. Um, it's it's really I mean things change so much in Venezuela that you might speculate all day about what might happen, but it looks right now it looks like the opposition is focusing its efforts on trying to break or create a gap in the military. Um, they're the ones who have who who are basically Maduro's force, right? They're the ones that are carrying out all of this repression. So I think their thinking is that if they're able to create this break in the military that they might that might help um it's also worth noting that you know in venezuela the people who are in the voting centers and who you know compile the actas to and um is it's called plan republica plan republic and it's conducted by the military so they know the results um i think that's where they're heading i think there's also hope that with the international community something might come out of it. I mean, Maduro right now, he's basically isolating himself. I mean, we might have a situation where it becomes a bit like Nicaragua, where you become a global pariah and you just entrench the whole country. But I I do think, too, that there's another added level of pressure for the world here, because like I've said, it's already 8 million people that have fled Venezuela Thousands are here in the U.S. A lot of them are in Colombia, in Peru, and in all these different countries. We're everywhere. I mean, I was in South Bend, Indiana, and there were over a thousand Venezuelans there. And we, there were two Venezuelan restaurants. And this is, is South Bend, Indiana. Um, and a lot of people have been already thinking of leaving the country. So you might have another um, wave of immigration. So, I mean, if if you're one of the countries that's saying that you can't take in more people and that you have problems in the border, you might care about this. Listen, we have a joke down here in Western Florida down here. It's Western Suela because of how many people live that came here from Venezuela. So, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for you, Maria, for, for kind of breaking down everything that's happening in Venezuela. And like I said, without doing the Van Jones and moving to emotion, because I know it is truly emotional. And and like I said, I still have family in Cuba on my dad's side. And so I know, and my wife as well, that, that is Cuban. Like I, I, I know the struggles maybe to a different extent. So I feel for you guys and for all my Venezuelan friends out there from not only HBO Latin American days, but here in Miami as well, that are going through it, that still have family and friends that live in Venezuela. You can check out all of Maria's work over at thewashingtonpost.com. Maria, I can't thank you enough for coming on the program today. Continue success to you. Please stay safe. Thank you.
All right, my thank yous again to Maria Luisa Pau for filling in for Nick Severi. Go check out all of her work at the Washington Post. You can hear it in her voice there, man. And I'm I'm telling you, and I, I feel for the people of Venezuela and for my friends here in Miami and, and around the country that are Venezuelan and they they are posting about what has been happening here. I wanted to devote some some coverage to that because it is something that on the global stage, I think, is being lost right now. So thank you to Maria for joining us and kind of breaking down everything that's happening there. If you want to check out the video portions of the interviews we've done with Maria or anybody else that's been on the program, head over to our YouTube channel, type in Can We Please Talk podcast. Do me a favor, hit subscribe while you're there. Audio podcast platforms, you know them by now, but you can listen on Apple, Spotify, Google. Shout out to everybody who listens to us over on Good Pods. Shout out to Acast, our hosting platform. We can't do it without them. Can't do it without each and every one of you that listens to this program. As always, I'm Mike Leon. We'll see everybody next time.